Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this academic season's final U.S. Studies online book hour. Our speakers will talk about 40 minutes or so about the book, um, The Effect in Pedagogy, as it relates to their respective theories, including reading from the chapters, and then we have time for a Q&A as well. And now I would like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Hilary Emmett is an associate professor in American studies at the University of East Anglia, where she specializes in transnational literary studies. She is the author of essays on a range of topics in comparative Australian and American studies, which have appeared in Journal of American Studies the, and Griffith Review with Claire Garbold, an Australasian Journal of American Studies and the MLA volume Teaching Australian and New Zealand Literature, among other forms. Dr. Betsy Bort is a poet and academic. Her chapbook, A Mediated and Partial Zone, is available from Guillermo Press. She is currently teaching and researching interdisciplinary theory and practice in liberal arts and natural sciences at the University of Birmingham. Dr. Declan Whiffen is a lecturer in contemporary literature and critical theory at the University of Kent. He's the editor of Litmus, the Lichen Issue, an anthology exploring the cultural representations of lichen and symbiosis. Dr. Christopher Lloyd is a senior lecturer in English literature and a learning and teaching specialist at the University of Hertfordshire. His new book projects include A Queer Bestiary and the Edinburgh Companion to the Millennial Novel, co-edited with Loïc Bordeaux. He is the co-editor of the European Journal of American Culture and the new vice chair of BAS. Dr. Hannah Lauren Murray teaches literature at the University of Melbourne. Before relocating to Australia, she was a lecturer in American literature at the University of Liverpool. Hannah researches whiteness in 19th century American literature, and her publications include Liminal Whiteness in Early U.S. Fiction, chapters in Oxford Handbook of Charles Brockton Brown and Wiley New Companion to Herman Melville, and an essay on teaching critical whiteness studies for English Journal of the English Association. Welcome all. Thank you so much. Um, Vice Chair of Bass sounds way more fancy than it is, just to clarify to everyone on the call. <laughs> it's, it's not as fun as it sounds. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. Um, I'm also going to put Betsy's poetry um, pamphlet in the chat so you can all buy it afterwards. Um, I feel like we need to <laughs> celebrate these uh, creative publications as well. Um, thank you for coming. We're going to talk broadly and loosely. So if anyone wants to interrupt at any point and ask questions, please do. We're not going to do a too formal thing here today. Um, so you're going to hear from our lovely speakers. We're going to read a little bit from the intro. Hillary and I, Hillary and I are going to introduce the book briefly now. Um, and then we've got some general questions at the end if people don't have any or just things we, we're now thinking about. Because this book feels like uh, it has been going on for a very long time, right? Like the moment we imagined the book right when we first were like we should do a cfp like i was living in another town that's how long ago it was um it feels like another world ago and in the middle we had that coronavirus thing right that happened that it's still happening and that changed the way we worked right like we were working at home we were looking after kids we were reimagining everything whilst also trying to write essays about feeling and emotion and affect like that was a lot, I think. Um, I'm looking at the three of you beneath us there. Um, I imagine you feel the same. And then we were then trying to kind of shepherd those essays into a kind of final form, right? Which was its own form of affect. So one of the things that I wanna kind of really stress is that to think about the affects of pedagogy in literary studies is also like the affects of, of this writing process, this editing process, and then publishing it. Um, so much went into the essays, but even thinking about a classroom set of affects, you're then writing about it, right, in a separate setting. And those affects then, I'm like, oh no, now those affects are in my house too, right? Like, it's not like I left them at work in that room, but rather they're now in my office. They're now, <laughs> in Sarah Ahmed's words, who we talk about a lot, uh, like stuck to stuff, right? They're now stuck to the way I write, the way I think. Um, so that was kind of my like opening pitch, really, is that, <laughs> this book is like a long process but also we feel like we're not quite done with it even though it's like in the world right it's in like a physical format um if you haven't ordered it to your libraries please do um and we're thinking about how we continue that conversation you know in these forums fora 
and then maybe beyond right like what does it look like to continue thinking about affect um beyond whether that's a different kind of dissemination but yeah something to pick up later maybe um Hillary, I don't know if you wanted to say anything after my ramble no it wasn't a ramble at all I think you you flagged everything I mean yeah to pick up the kind of you know that that Armenian um idea of stuckness like yeah I mean it's still the pandemic and pedagogy is still stuck to my kitchen table where I homeschooled you know my youngest kid it stuck to my oldest kid's study bunk because I was interrupted by one of my students to say are you under a study bunk um where they could clearly see that there was like a bed <laughs> at the top and I was like yes it's the only quiet space in the house you know to to kick the um yeah the, the you know the oldest child out in order to, to teach my own class so so yeah, so just to say that those, I think we haven't quite recompartmentalized for better or worse, um, these spaces um, of teaching, but also just to reiterate what Chris said, which is we feel like, you know, we feel like there is still unfinished business around the, the effects of pedagogy because so many people were able to pick up and engage the pandemic um, in their chapters for this book, but it was also the elephant in the room for others who had planned their chapters well before, you know, the pandemic was kind of a, you know, a thing or anything that, that anyone could have conceived of. Um, because the book was actually originally conceived of as a response to kind of the affects generated by Trump and Brexit, really, in our classrooms. Um, it came out of a presentation from the UEA Teaching and Learning Day, I think in must have been 2017 that reflected on the events of 2016 and how destabilizing that have been for our students. So, um, so yeah, there's there's a lot, and I think a lot more to be said. So I think part of what we want to do today is definitely reflect on what we did, but hopefully push the conversation forward. But. Yeah, I should probably also say, like the book is only a kind of partial enterprise, right? There was so much that. We plan to have in it but then people dropped out for various reasons right as one does in a book project um there were kind of topics that we wanted more about say digitality right like especially as we're moving into the digital world that people either weren't wanting to write about or maybe weren't thinking about in ways that we were so like there's lots of kind of different overlaps there right um at least two of the contributors have left academia since the book kind of came into being Right. And like we know that some of the other contributors are on the borders of it anyway, right? Working in different ways. But that's also a point that we should note that one of the essays is about failure and said person no longer works in academia anymore, right? Because of the ways in which academia pressures one to feel, act, um, inhabit bodies in a certain way. Right. So I feel like that's worth saying in this space because we can't talk about the embodied nature of teaching without reflecting on like the actual material conditions in which that happens um, and those material conditions are what they are we know what higher education is I don't need to tell all of you on this call um there's nothing new there but yeah just I, it's worth flagging whenever we see these things just to say that um but Hilary did you want to read a little bit from the yep. intro as a way in yes so uh, the the section I'm going to read from um picks up Sarah Ahmed, um, who was absolutely central, I think, to just about everyone's thinking about, about this project and thinking about pedagogy, um, but also to give a big shout out to Zain Yao, and I'm, I'm not going to read the sort of analysis and breakdown of, of their work that, that we do a bit later on in the introduction, but just to say that um, that their book was absolutely so disaffected, The Cultural Politics of Unfeeling in 19th Century America was absolutely central to drawing our attention to the ways in which the work of, of affect and effective ways of approaching literature has been done for a really long time by a huge range of scholars who don't necessarily identify as affect theorists and that, that that was a really useful kind of reorientation I think for us in terms of who to read and where to go when putting together a you know a kind of lit review I guess of of where affect studies was at and affect and pedagogy was at so so even though that actually comes after the section I'm going to read it very much informed our, our ways of thinking about different approaches to affect Okay, so many of the essays in this book turn to feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed for her insights not only into affect and emotion, but also into the contemporary university. And I think that what Chris has just said, you know, kind of would jump off um, very much from there. So Ahmed helps us rethink how emotions are framed and theorized, in part by attending to the sociality of emotions, 
That is the way in which they move, travel, and stick to people and spaces. She writes, emotions create the very effect of the surfaces and boundaries that allow us to distinguish an inside and an outside in the first place. So emotions are not simply something that I or we have. Rather, it is through emotions or how we respond to objects and others that surfaces or boundaries are made. In suggesting that emotions create the very effect of an inside and outside, I am not then simply claiming that emotions are psychological and social, individual and collective. My model refuses the abbreviation of the and. But otherwise, this is us now, um, emotions are not in or do not come from individual people or social settings, but rather in themselves produce the very surfaces and boundaries that allow the individual and the social to be defined as if they are objects. That's from Ahmed again. Objects take on objecthood and texture through the circulation and sociality of emotions. More particularly, when thinking about those feelings or affects that become shared, think in our context of a silent or tense or joyous or chatty or delirious classroom. Ahmed tells us that it's the objects of emotion that circulate rather than the emotion as such, is the objects of emotions that circulate rather than the emotion as such, because a shared feeling is never exactly the same for everyone. Objects of emotion move and become sticky or saturated with affect, and as such help to reinforce or construct the boundaries of the subjects with which they come into contact. Extending this thought into literary studies pedagogy, what might it mean to theorise the objects of emotion and affect that construct the subjects of student and teacher in the first place? The boundaries between the I of teacher and you of student are made through the ways in which we respond, consciously or not, to the objects of emotion that circulate around us and perhaps stick to us. Our objects clearly might be texts or other books or desks or classroom walls or projectors and computers or whiteboard markers or any other number of physical and material objects, as well as those less tangible objects like a virtual learning environment or a piece of homework or an upcoming test. Theories of affect and emotion, grounded as they are in the particular, the specific and the contextual, help us see the often unseen elements of pedagogic work and thus help us reimagine that work. Among other things, Ahmed's work helps us reorient affect studies away from a few main scholars and into a wider and more diverse terrain of thinking about textured theory. And I think we want to jump off there to um, to hand to to Declan and Betsy, um, whose chapter is an absolute object lesson in rethinking those boundaries, or I guess just being within the restructuring of boundaries that takes place when you author a work collaboratively in a collaborative pedagogic space, when a pedag pedagogic space doesn't quite go how you anticipated it might um, at the time. So so we just, we feel as though that chapter is, um, is absolutely brilliant um, and hugely thought provoking account of, of what pedagogy can look like um, and some of the, the challenges and also um, product, you know, productivity, I guess, creativity that that can elicit. So I'm going to hand to Declan and Betsy now to talk a little bit about sticky objects um, and, and rethinking pedagogical space, I guess. Great. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that you enjoyed the chapter because, um, yeah, as Hilary said, um, the impetus for the chapter was not necessarily or initially um, a particularly good experience, um, which we'll go on to talk about shortly. Um, but yeah, thank you for um, that framing. Um, and just uh, Betsy and I are going to read the, the first little section and then I'm going to talk briefly about the context of how we got to write the piece and then Betsy's going to say a little bit um, as well um, as she talks to somebody who's doing the scaffolding. Um, maybe I'll give a little bit of context before we read um, to give Betsy a minute. Um, so I was teaching um, an undergraduate third year module which was a creative critical module um, and it kind of resolved, um, revolved around the idea that there might be value in things that we struggle to articulate, we can't articulate, or that we might articulate messily, which um, in literary studies where writing essays, talking in seminars is often about articulation and people are graded on articulating things well, this module sought to provide a space and um, support for thinking about the things that we maybe aren't able to do or things that are that we find a challenge to put into that usual framework. Um, so we responded to this event, which we're going to talk about um, in a collaborative, creative, critical method, which is a dialogue 
um, predominantly between Betsy and I, um, but also we wanted to involve um, student voices because they were involved in this extracurricular activity. Um, and initially we thought it would be multivocal in that we would write it completely collectively. Um, and then the pandemic happened and actually I wasn't quite sure how it was going to work doing it collectively, but that was the, that was the intention. Then the pandemic happened. So um, it's mainly a dialogue between Betsy and I, but the narrative of, of the anecdote of what happened on this um, extracurricular activity is mainly narrated through the students' eyes and, and we've brought it together. So it does include a lot of voices, um, five voices excluding the critics. Um, so it's multivocal. It is a bit messy, it's structured as a dialogue, um, but that's part of the, the affect and the, the style that we wanted to include. Um, that's how you're doing, you uh, okay? Yes, <laughs> thanks. I, uh, we just, um, just had someone knocking at my window. He's like suspended halfway up my like <laughs> second floor building. So okay. quite exciting this end. Okay. Um, thanks Eklund for taking over. Okay. Yeah, well, should we read and then? Let's read, then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so the <laughs> the title okay. is Collective Anecdotal Generative Refusal, A Queer Feminist Pedagogy of the Unknown. Uh, opening dialogue. And we have a chat about that time we took some undergrad students to Paris and went uh, to a reading with that white cis het male author who we call A. You want to talk about that again? <laughs> yeah, again. The experience has stuck to me in a way that indicates something of greater significance, uh, a connection to a larger personal, but also social histories. Memories can, as Sarah Ahmed says, become sticky or saturated with affect as sites of personal and, and social tension." End of quote. Um, did it not stick to you? Yes, I think it did in the way an unanswered question is sticky. My attention keeps returning to it. We clearly cannot resolve this as individuals. Let's write a dialogue about affect and pedagogy that begins with this anecdotal encounter with fragile masculinity. Um, do we want to use emotion rather than affect in this anecdotal context? We're writing from a queer and feminist perspective, and thus I'm inclined to take our cue from Nahmed, who, although does use the word affect, I hadn't written that in the, in the text, but who challenges the distinction between emotion and affect, writing, quote, it might even be that the very use of this distinction performs the evacuation of certain styles of thought, brackets, we might think of these as touchy-feely styles of thought, including feminist and queer, close bracket, from affect studies. Emotion, I think, refocuses attention away from exactly what was said or read and onto how it was felt or experienced. And so our return to it and to the feelings surrounding it can be a way forward out of the event and into new ways of seeing and thinking? Question mark. Question mark. Yes, <laughs> comma. And uh, that work, um, that can work together to understand how welcoming the unknown into a pedagogical space is useful. Ahmed again writes that so much follows when we do not assume we always know how we feel and that feelings do not belong or even originate with an I. Let's try and produce a dialogic reflection on this collective anecdote. And dialogue because it's not merely about the self, collective because dialogue is never just between two, and anecdote because this text is an attempt to resist that which is authorised. Our pedagogical tool is the anecdote as a space which specifically retains a touchy-feely mode of thought. As Jane Gallup writes, anecdotes become interesting precisely for their ability um, to intervene in contemporary theoretical debates. The anecdote's capacity to refigure hierarchies of intertwined narratives by foregrounding the emotions of those who experience and continue to experience an event, as well as its personal and meandering qualities, insists that what is interesting is not just the facts, but the feelings too. And on this point, Sayan um, Nye suggests that the experience of the interesting becomes, uh, sorry, begins with a feeling, inquisitiveness, curiosity, wonder, falling somewhere between an affect and desire. How then to have a collective anecdotal dialogue that pivots around the shifting ground of what is interesting? Yes, I think that's a good question. 
I think we begin by acknowledging that dialogue is not a neutral term. It's always riven by power imbalances and may shore up an oppression as easily as dismantle it. The following failure of a collective dialogue in that bookshop in Paris is a way of exploring and refiguring some of the power structures, starting with the contention that, quote, refusal itself can be a form of affirmative dialogue. Who is in this uh, collective dialogue then? There's me, uh, at the time a graduate teaching assistant, middle class, white cis woman, early 30s, but look mid 20s. Uh, you, a cis, uh, queer, white British man, early 30s and look early 30s. Also undergraduates and, M and MA students, the bookshop owner and staff, members of the public, and the writer who were calling A, so how to fit in all these voices as well as fold in an awareness of existing power structures? We might not get them all in, but sometimes it's as easy as inviting people to speak, asking them how they feel and listening. Um, and, and yeah, as I said, that's the end of our little reading section. We invited um, our students, everyone who was kind of in that to send us their responses to this event. And just to quickly, I haven't, we haven't really exactly said what, what happened at the event, but we, I was part of this reading, students were there in Paris as part of this module, extracurricular activity. Um, and I had not, I had not, when I got involved with this reading at the bookshop, uh, which is owned by a friend of mine, I hadn't read the author's work, but with good intention, and I thought this will be a nice experience. Um, the author um, didn't respond to me that well. Um, the author's writing was um, kind of quite stereotypically macho and um, a bit misogynistic. And his responses to my questions and the students' questions were subtly homophobic and misogynistic. Um, and the event ended earlier than planned um, at my uh, finishing. Um, and you know, I, 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 you know, immediately felt like it had been a failure. Uh, I was embarrassed. Um, I was a bit shocked. And we took the students afterwards for, for dinner um, and we kind of debriefed and talked about what had happened. And then the next day, we also met with the MA students collectively and talked it through. And it became this, this thing which wasn't a very nice experience for me or some of the students. We responded to it in a way which um, was actually really generative um, and that was the impetus for trying to work through and, and create through the writing space as well, including the students, as, as much as possible, um, a new kind of pedagogical space. Yeah, I think um, just to sort of, um, I'm going to briefly just return back to our title, um, because if you want to find out more about the uh, anecdote and what happened, then buy the book and read the chapter. Um, and I just want to pick up on two things uh, uh, Chris and Hilary said in, in your great framing, one about kind of the shepherding of essays and one about the creation of the classroom space. Um, because uh, the way that Declan and I just read that is I mean, you guys were super open to us presenting this chapter in this very like split format. We have like fonts that uh, speak to our own uh, pieces of writing. Um, it's quite sort of lumpy and strange and, and absolutely resists like this form of like, you know, introduction, hypothesis, you know, results and analysis, conclusion, et cetera, um, which is, you know, quite a risk. Uh, a lot of it comes from sort of uh, our like feelings um, emerging out of it and then connecting that to kind of wider um, theoretical framings. Um, and yeah, and what uh, Hilary, you're kind of talking about the, the, the way that objects of the classroom, what happens when we kind of reframe what the classroom is? And, you know, in one sense, it is completely decamping to this different city it's also this sort of extracurricular event but the classroom was also yeah the Italian restaurant we had to afterwards or the email exchanges we had with students and also this space that Declan and I, and I have used to kind of write this strange little work so our title uh collective it's just got so many great words in it it's really like perfectly search engine optimized I think Collective, anecdotal and generative refusal, a queer feminist pedagogy of the unknown. And I just wanted to kind of dwell for a second on both anecdotal and generative refusal. Um, so the first, uh, this sort of idea of anecdotal, 
uh, I think it was really important to us to uh, think about where knowledge is produced in a classroom um, and where we kind of um, where what what um, what we what we're bringing into the classroom and what we're taking out of it. And I think that the anecdote is this way of really complicating what the dialogue is. You know, the dialogue is a combative space, a sort of a like between two um, has like it's so weighty with all its kind of um, previous <laughs> um, iterations. Um, and yeah, so really thinking about what the anecdote as like a place where knowledge is produced can be. And and this is our like initial experiment in using it in this kind of um, pedagogical way. And then this idea of generative refusal. So yeah, thinking about refusal as a, as a form of block, but what happens if you can kind of dwell with that as well and sort of digest it into something that uh, that then has goes on to have a further life. So taking something that should be like a sort of a stoppage, a, a break, a rupture, and actually out of that developing, um, yeah, developing something living rather than something completely uh, kind of closing and dead. Um, so yeah, those were our, some of our kind of initial thoughts. Um, maybe we'll, Douglas, unless you have anything else you want to add, maybe we'll kind of pause there and we can always come back, um, back to anything. Yeah, that sounds good. I just wanted to reiterate how much we love your chapter. And actually, to be very fair to Routledge, I know that academic publishers get a bit of a bad rap these days. They were really great about us demanding, uh, requesting politely, um, that this chapter come back to us multiple times to make sure that, that we had that right. So thank you for coming up this way of, of framing it and also for pushing back and saying, actually, the font needs to look like this. Can we do this a little bit differently? Um, genuinely, like it was we were really delighted with the way it, the way it turns out. And I, I think rather than uh, I don't want to. I don't want to devalue your account of it as non-nominative and messy, but I think it's beautiful. Like we, I, anyway, I, I love the way it looks on the page. Um, and I guess I also just wanted to add into that account of the anecdote that um, one of the things I really love about this chapter is the kind of reparative reading that you do of the very idea of anecdote, right? Which for a really long time has been kind of abjected and devalued mm. as a mode of, certainly when I was an undergraduate, like you could not bring anecdote into the classroom that was just the worst thing um that you could do you would be written off sort of diminished by the lecturers I did also go to university in the mid 90s when things were I think less kind than they can be now um but yeah so just I mean one of the things I really valued was your your thinking through the anecdotes um and bringing that back into the pedagogic space in ways that that give value to actual experience right and those embodied mm -hmm. experiences so so yeah. again you know well we wouldn't wish that difficult experience on anyone it's just been so rich yeah. I think. Yeah. So. thank you that's really that's really kind and nice to hear so thank you and thanks for bearing with us with the fonts and this and the structure and, yeah. oh, it's great it's great it's great it makes it very special we love all our contributors um <laughs> But, but yeah, this was this was particularly... And it does a great reading as well. It has this beautiful performative quality that really kind of draws all of that in. And this is one of the things that really struck me when I was reading the book is, is that Chris does that as well, but in a different way, this kind of fragmentation and this kind of playing with the format. Um, it, it was very interesting to read because that kind of pushes you as a reader also kind of consider things very differently. Um, I'm just curious if you could elaborate a little bit, both Chris and Betsy and Declan, how did you conceive these kind of different formatting and what was the purpose for you? What was the effect you wanted to have from that for the reader? And how did that kind of play for your own theory and your own conception of your chapters? Mm -hmm. I'll just say, I'll just say briefly, because I feel like I've, I've spoken quite a lot in this already, but I think in the debrief of what happened with the with the students, it was such a different type of um, of discussion. Which obviously, in classrooms, people often bring their own personal experience into it, and and that's I always welcome that. Um, but sometimes it's uh, it, it's not the focus of the learning experience. Like a text is the focus of the learning experience, whereas 
actually his text was not the focus of our learning experience. It was the, our collective experience. And I think um, we wanted to make sure that we didn't just completely theoretically come at it. No, that's not the word I'm looking for. We didn't want to make it all about theory because it had been a lived experience and we wanted to retain that quality. Um, and there's a quote at the beginning and, and this kind of st it stuck with me and I hadn't quite resolved it and I didn't quite know what to do with my, even though it, would, it be, had become this really good learning experience, it had still stuck with me and kind of was niggling. And I wanted to, I guess I needed to process it a bit more and think about the good and bad aspects of, of the pedagogy. Um, and Chechkovich says, and you, you quote this in the introduction, and you say that the whole collection is wanting to do this, but to shine a spotlight on how both global politics and history and daily life mani manifest themselves at the level of lived experience. And I think that's a very articulate way of saying what we were trying to do through anecdote. Um, think about these larger forces which manifest in, in feeling, but also in lived experience. Um, yeah, yeah. And just just to add tiny sort of to the the way that we then came to writing that in the sort of actual sort of physical structure of the chapter, it was then really important to us that it wasn't this sort of monolithic unified format that that it was sort of a bit um, that it that it was a bit raggedy that there were we we um, aside from kind of putting them together we didn't edit the words from the students and you know some of the words are like not words that we would have chosen to write but to actually try to kind of give a bit of space to that um I think for Declan and I this was actually the one of the most useful things was our learning experience out of it how to sort of let go a little bit of you know we're we're all supposed to be outstanding academics in our field but actually to kind of subsume ourselves a little bit um and and you know just really play with the, the the object of the text you know we have all the we have thousands and millions of fonts why not like use some of them we have spaces that we can use why not use some of them why not kind of actually pay attention to to where it is again where the knowledge is produced actually on the page to be able to kind of see that breakdown so yeah the physical form and the kind of theoretical underpinning really kind of were interlinked for us um yeah that outstanding academics in our field was because that also plays to what Chris was writing about the teacher always in control myth as well. So I kind of that kind of for me links nicely together as well. Yeah, I mean, because that I take from Deborah Britzman, right, who's both a psychoanalyst and a teacher of teachers. So she trains higher educational professionals. So she's like reflecting on all these different levels all the time. Um, and what she's taking from uh, her kind of therapy office is like, you think you're in control of your life, right? Like, like we think we're not driven by unconscious forces. Like, why do you think that's not the case in a classroom, right? Like, why would you be uh, delusional to think that you're in control of what's happening in a space where there's so many people, right? With different investments and all these different things. Um, so thinking about your two, like, even if you had <laughs> Declan, like known about this author or researched him or read his books or whatever, I think there's still that element of the unknown, right? You could invite someone who you think is like super nice and like on it and you know, all those things. And then they're gonna say something that you never expected, right? Like um, we cannot control much <laughs> in, the, yeah, in these uh, teaching settings. Sorry, go on. I was just gonna say hundred percent like that. No, 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 it's fine, yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. If, um, you know, even if you know the person, um, or, you know, you have a group of students, you don't know what they're going to say, and it can be, you know, they can drop bombs and you think, oh, yeah, how do we respond to that? Yeah. 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 And I think that's one of the, one of the things I was thinking about in my chapter, it's called discomforts with a slash in between. Dis and comforts because, I mean, there were so many contexts in which that word was coming up or that feeling was coming up for me, whereby people were saying stuff and I was like, hmm. What do I do with this, right? And I suddenly just kind of like gathered them together. And immediately I was like, I'm not able to write about these in a legible formal way, right? They're not gonna just tie themselves together quite easily. Um, and my main, my, my go-to teaching point is form and content are inseparable, right? If we're teaching a text, form and content are inseparable. I say it 5,000 times, um, whether people hear it or take it up, I don't know. But anyway, like it's my kind of daily, lesson and I was like well why would that not be the case for an academic piece of writing right so to write about discomfort in which 
we are coming up against those things that we find difficult to look at, the writing should therefore kind of emulate some of that. So it's kind of broken up just into sections with these little slashes in between, because one thing doesn't follow one from another, right? Like the nature of affective feeling is that it comes up sometimes when you aren't expecting it. Um, I kind of list different things like, you know, you spill your tea on your trousers before you go into teach class and you're like, great. You know, that's definitely <laughs> happened to me before. Or, you know, your phone's going off in your bag or whatever it is, right? Or the room is freezing or you go to the wrong classroom, set up, get a nice vibe going and then you realize you're actually next door, which happened to me last semester. And all the students were like, why are you in here? And I was like, oh God. But like, I'd had the room, per like I rearranged the tables. I put nice music on in the background. I had the temperature right. Like I had all my papers out and I was like, no, we're next door. And I go in next door and obviously the room is disgusting and tiny and all the tables are wrong. And I'm like, great. You know what I mean? Like everything you want to try and do, things get away from you. So the writing had to, for me, follow some of that too. And it also helped. It kind of helped with the writing actually, because it meant I didn't have to, I guess, and this goes to your piece as well, of like not having to find a conclusion to things necessarily, right? Like there's no, this is the takeaway. <laughs> actually, or like, this is what I want to resolve because discomfort can't be resolved, right? That's the point. It's about sitting with it. Um, and by discomfort, by the way, I just want to clarify, like, I'm not talking about, you know, our students should be uncomfortable thing, right? That's that's circulating in right-wing discourse, right? Um, our students should be traumatized or, you know, all of that kind of stuff that you can see on Twitter, right? Just Google it. Um, that, you know, they should have a hard time in learning because learning is difficult. Like, no, that's... <laughs> Anyway, I just wanted to make that clear. I'm talking about the discomforts of like what happens if a student challenges us or what happens if something comes up in a room we don't know how to handle or what happens if you feel like, you know, a bad thing but you've still got to go on for another two hours. Um, how do you push through that? How do you sit with it? How do you make room for it? Um, yeah, so that's kind of like where that was coming for, for me. But reading your chapter is also helpful in that process and some of the others as well because I think everyone is thinking about the difficult stuff and and we really appreciated that when we first got all the drafts in I think we were like oh no this is a this is triggering in ways I didn't expect um and we have an essay on triggers so you know um what I want to do is uh segue a little bit to think about more about that classroom then um and the space of teaching so I'm going to read a little section about um some of one of the main theoretical touch points other than Ahmed that we were using um and it's an essay called the affects of not reading and one of the co-authors of that actually was the lovely um Tully Barnett who blurred the book for us um who is uh fantastic and there's a great there's a great blurb from them in the front um so we want to thank them we keep thanking them because they were so supportive of the project from day one they were just like I love this idea please write it um and that really um buoyed us didn't it um through, through the through the whole thing so I just want to read a little section. I'm actually sharing it so you can all read along, actually. Um, might be nice. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then it's not just me reading. And if you get bored, you can just read it yourself. Um, okay. So a, a high watermark for our thinking about affect theory and the practice of pedagogy has been Anna Paletti at Owls, the affects of not reading, hating characters, being bored, feeling stupid, favorite essay title. Their article begins by acknowledging that most teachers of literature have faced classrooms where students did not read the text for what are often affective reasons, anxiety, boredom, confusion. And we could probably add to that as well, right? Like they're working, they have lives, they're caring, they're looking after family members. They've got a lot on, right? They're also living through a planet on fire. Through informal discussions with colleagues and friends, the authors determined that many teachers of literature necessarily develop ad hoc pedagogical strategies that tend to reduce the amount of time students spend with texts. So these ad hoc strategies might be teaching shorter books. Um, so they kind of give examples of like, you know, using this one thing rather than like Bleak House, right? You might use one of the shorter Dickens or a short story or something. Um, just analyzing photocopies of pages in class using extras. In looking at the quote, effective components of reading as a core activity of literary studies and considering how affect shapes students' experiences of reading, the teachers' expectations and responses to students in the classroom environment itself, the authors seek to foster more positive feelings towards the difficulty of literary reading analysis and in turn shape students into more resilient readers. 
resilient is an interesting word. We can pick up that maybe if you want to talk about. I have mixed feelings about resilience, but anyway. Um, they thus created the Reading Resilience Toolkit, which puts emphasis on reading with patience, perseverance, understanding, and appreciation. It is a great toolkit if anybody hasn't used it. It's a really lovely set of resources. Um, even when a text is complicated or seemingly unnavigable, rather than negate a student's initial effective responses to text, boredom, anxiety, feelings of stupidity, and so on, Reading Resilience asks students to recognize and move beyond those sensations. And in the words of Derek Attridge, be hospitable to the text as something other than oneself. In short, Paletia, I'll argue thinking of reading as a scene of hospitality that occurs within the assemblage of particular literary studies course allows us to recognize that the kind of reading we are asking our students to engage in is a profoundly risky and anxiety promoting act of hospitality, an act of opening oneself to the text as other, an act of enjoying and demystifying literature. So their work, in short, helps us theorize both the affect of reading and the pedagogic account as shaped by affect. And moreover, it uses the language of affect to stage the process of reading and teaching in new ways. And we thought that would be a really wonderful way in to thinking about Hannah's essay, um, which is very much useful for this American Studies audience um, and is very much about that classroom setting and what happens with reading difficult stuff <laughs> right Hannah? and and the way in which how do you help students navigate that difficulty rather than just be like well it's difficult so I didn't want to engage right so we want to hand over to Hannah to talk a little bit about um, your chapter oh, thanks very much and Hilary and everyone for being here um and I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from unceded Wurrung land in Melbourne and also to offer my solidarity with colleagues in the UK currently undertaking industrial action. Um, I've also been undertaking industrial action at Melbourne. Um, so I'm going to just start with the opening of the chapter and then I'll move on to discuss a bit of what I actually did, the work I carried out um, that's in this chapter and some reflections I have a few years after writing the chapter. Oh, so this is the opening of the chapter. In his 2016 essay, Turn It Up, Affects, Structures of Feeling and Face-to-Face -face Education, Jeffrey Sanborn considers the effective relations fostered in scholarly communities. Writing on new directions in literary scholarship, he posits that a new field of study it occurs as a turning up the volume on our collective interest in the field, bringing together and amplifying individual voices until they forge a new collective movement and identity. Referring to the moment a party gets started in The Great Gatsby, Sanborn playfully asks, is there a relationship between, say, putting together a literary studies symposium and getting a party started on the dance floor? Yes. Is there anything wrong with that relationship? No. Scholars come together to share ideas, challenge or develop arguments and plan future projects over terrible coffee, triangle shaped sandwiches and cheap wine. Through this dancing analogy, we can think of a scholarly community as a movement that energizes individuals and centers human interaction. Like a party or a conference, a seminar is also the product of an occasion, constantly moving and turning with each new participant adding to the discussion. It is a space of discovery where students can collaborate as the discussion moves and turns with each new voice. The best seminars occur when tutors have to do very little to provoke discussion, when students riff on a specific passage, character, or an event from a text that relates to their own lives or approach to literature. However, there are many times when no one speaks, when, one, when no one knows the answer, even if there is one, no one cares about the text, or when no one has the confidence to say they do not know the answer. You can also add to this when nobody puts on their webcam or turns on their microphone. This chapter uh, focuses on those feelings of confusion and stuckness when studying and also teaching literature. In the seminar, teachers regularly encounter students who do not understand the material in front of them, and we ourselves can feel stuck in knowing how to progress these conversations. Our enthusiasm and expertise can come up against students who feel disconnected from 
and confused by texts. If tutors do not have strategies in place to acknowledge and address points of confusion, the seminar can grind to a halt. Students can lose an opportunity for support. And at worst, the tutor can resent students who cannot comprehend the material. To borrow Sanborn's party analogy again, the seminar can sometimes feel like a terrible party where the tutor is the only one on the dance floor. I should probably also add the tutor has um, put together the playlist or something like that as well. So you're in total control, but you're just by yourself dancing. Um, so I originally had the idea for this chapter uh, after applying for my fellowship of the Higher Education Academy in the UK. And the people who've gone through that process know it's not really interested in how you feel as an educator or how students feel. Um, and it can actually be a really tedious process. But what it does offer going through this application is the opportunity to focus on really small aspects of teaching practice or interventions that you can make in lectures or small group teaching. Uh, so that's what I wanted to uh, write about this experience I had trying to tackle confusion and stuckness when reading some quite difficult material. So as I discussed in the chapter, I had noticed that the first time I taught early American literature um, at King's, and this is a module which spanned from Columbus's journals all the way up to Broughton Brown's Wheeland in 1798. When I taught that for the first time, students struggled to comprehend early English settler theology in John Winthrop's writing, um, to the point where they made incorrect statements in seminars. This resulted in reticence and misunderstanding um, of later weeks on Puritan writing. Um, we had about four or five weeks on Puritans and then um, the Great Awakening. This confusion not only presented an obstacle for studying uh, on the rest of the module uh, and assessment, but it also made me feel really anxious uh, and embarrassed that I wasn't doing a very good job and frustrated that students just weren't getting it or that they were not even trying to get it. And Picking up on a, another anxiety, I had that students in English departments only take American literature because they think it's the easy option um, for some reason, uh, and that they may not be actually willing to engage in the hard work. So in the chapter, I briefly discussed what's tricky about comprehending Winthrop's A Model of Christian Charity from 1630 as a 21st century secular British student, um, who would expect as a 21st century British student that you'd end up reading 17th century American sermons on your English degree. I didn't expect that when I did my degree. And then I also talked about how I tackled this threshold text by making the central image of the text, the city on the hill, accessible through examples of modern interpretation, whether right or wrong interpretation from uh, JFK and Mitt Romney. So I think that in doing so, I not only alleviated student confusion, which was evident in better discussions and assessment responses I had the following year, but I also enabled students to think more holistically about American intellectual history and often through these incorrect responses uh, and readings uh, by somebody like Mitt Romney, the misappropriation of the Puritans and their writing. So I, I think this chapter offers a kind of close up case study of a practical change that I made to teaching delivery in order to get past that first hurdle of students literally being able to comprehend the text. Um, so looking back, a few years later, having written this chapter. I wrote this chapter in the midst of not just classroom confusion, but worldwide confusion as the world shut down. Uh, my students were not only struggling to understand complex literary works, but had almost completely checked out of the learning process. Um, they were ill, working in key professions or suddenly out of work and turning off their webcams and mics. So from writing this chapter and through teaching 
online during lockdown and since then, I've gained a greater understanding and appreciation of the lecture format, particularly the pre-recorded lecture as a venue to guide students through comprehension, through the examples and the explication that we can carry out. My pre-recorded lectures focused more on context and explaining concepts so that in the tutorial, we could attempt to work towards interpretation, which I discuss at the end of the chapter as one of the positives of feeling confused and stuck, that opportunity to ask questions and think through what we interpret and believe about a text. So I just wanted to say thanks to Hilary and Chris again for their insightful comments and encouragement on the chapter. Um, and I'll wrap up there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hannah. Um, <clears throat> I have so many thoughts, but yeah. Um, does anyone in the room want to ask anything? I actually had a thought, something what you were saying, Chris, earlier about the resilience reading and the concept that Hannah is writing about, the threshold concept. Um, I see, uh, could, do you see them kind of uniting as two concepts and how you would, if you would elaborate on those as well as, as the, and especially the threshold concept, because that's such a key for students in anything they're learning in classroom as well, is it to, to be able to access the material that is daunting for whatever reason, whether it is a different nation or different era or different this and that. So I thought that was such a key concept that I would like to hear a bit more about and then how that relates to that whole resilience reading or reading resistance, for example. Yeah, Hannah, do you wanna, but also do you wanna maybe explain what a threshold concept is for those that might not know if there's, you know, people in the room that may not know it. Yeah, I'm just gonna find the good quote <laughs> about it. Um, so a threshold concept um, comes from the work of Ray Land et al, um, a 2005 article. Um, which is from the Oxford Center for Staff and Learning Development. And it is one of the readings that I had to do for my uh, professional development, which led to my fellowship. So even though those sessions can feel extremely tedious, there's actually a lot of material you can be directed to that can, can help your teaching practice. Um, so a threshold concept um, is a piece of information or skill uh, that comes early in a topic or a class. And if students don't understand that concept or skill or information, they can't move forward in the topic. Um, so, for example, with Winthrop, if you don't understand how English settler theology works in the 1730s, you're probably not going to understand how it works in the 1640s um, or 50s or uh, 80s when you read other Puritan writers. Uh, so you just continually start to, this it kind of snowballs, you just continue to misunderstand and misapply ideas. Um, and it will result in poor assessment, essentially. Um, so in order to learn a threshold concept effectively, Land et al say, um, you need to have this transformative experience where your understanding is properly and significantly shifted so that you now correctly perceive the concept. It needs to be irreversible so the student hopefully won't forget the concept when you've taught it to them. And it needs to be uh, integrative. Um, so it needs to have a greater purpose of showing how a topic um, is connected, or in this case, a module or a reading list. Um, so that's what I was trying to do through teaching Winthrop is coming up with a memorable way that students will understand what, for example, a city on a hill means in Winthrop's work. Um, and they won't forget it because I've used this example of JFK and Mitt Romney. Um, and Romney was giving a talk about Trump and while well, I was teaching Trump as president. So there's some kind of current um, contemporary currency uh, and also I was thinking about and trying to get them to think about how understandings of Winthrop had changed over the centuries to the point where somebody like Mitt Romney could misunderstand and misinterpret 
um, and the importance of that Puritan theology in the rest of early American literature. Uh, so that's what a threshold that's perfect. I was also going to say Mitt Romney misunderstanding something like <laughs> who knew um but yeah that threshold is like so important and so I mean there are so many disciplines where those threshold concepts may be more precise and definitive right like if you think about like the sciences and the math and stuff sometimes it's like well like if you don't understand this equation like nothing else is going to happen I feel like within our world they could be a bit more nebulous, right? That were a little, little bit more hazy on the edges. So that like, even that, like understanding that theological context, you're kind of also needing to understand some other little bits that are tacked on around it, right? Or even the form of the sermon. Like there's so many things about uh, Winthrop that I think that you've like raised in that chapter about even how we approach a threshold concept as something that's effective, but also within the literary setting. Um, but Robin, you put your hand up, so go for it. I think, yeah. Um, thank you all so much. Um, really, really interesting discussion. Um, I had sort of a, a slightly broader question, I guess, about um sort of navigating the classroom space and your experiences with sort of responding and adapting to sort of the new ways we consume media and literature. I think like the TikTokification of consumption is is a really interesting process. And I think um definitely, you know, how do we make sort of where students or, or I think everybody really is used to accessing information in like these sound bites, how we kind of adapt and especially responding where it's so fast paced, there's not really this space to process the effect of what we're consuming, how you kind of navigate that in like an hour <laughs> seminar potentially. Our lovely contributors, why don't you take this very difficult question? I think um, something that I uh, I think is maybe an interesting or something that like ha having gone myself through the uh, higher education fellowship recently as well, solidarity, I know it's really boring, um, was also just a way of thinking like, okay, what is like, do technologies or like changing formats and platforms, what do they offer and what do they actually fundamentally change? I mean, like, our practice as like literary scholars is about the kind of fundamentals of asking questions and I think that there's a there's a way in which sort of actually uh it we're encouraged to kind of you know think about technologies as as new portals into ways that the humanities can be useful and literary studies can be useful and like tend this use value where actually we can use things like poetry as a critical lens, not just as like a communicative tool or yeah, this understanding of like literary threshold concepts um, in early Puritan American writings as a critical lens to critique te platforms and technologies. So it isn't just about making like the ways in which we teach super sexy, but I think it's about saying, okay, like let's learn these skills and apply them to, to, the, to the technologies and the, and the things that we have. Um, and also to slightly resist because uh, if there's nothing sadder than a than a tutor being the a seminar leader being the only one dancing in the middle of a classroom, there's also literally nothing sadder than like developing a classroom on Facebook where like all your students are completely somewhere else, and if we try to chase them there, they will just want us to leave them alone. <laughs> Does anyone else want to take that one? Uh, Hillary has a hand up there. I did. I had another question for Hannah, but I'm happy to to jump in here. I I guess I think to endorse what um what Betsy's saying in the sense of you know we yeah nothing sadder than than being on Facebook when actually our students are on Insta or wherever. So I guess in a way, I've kind of doubled down on a lot of my anxieties about kind of the the TikTok generation and and ways of using technology. And this is a luxury that we've only had post pandemic if we are indeed post as Chris and I have discussed um but I have really gone back to um the photocopied bit of text right and the pencil and actually my students delight in being given a pencil right like I went to the station and again you know this requires a university to be flush enough um that you can go and get some pencils for your class um, and mine very soon will not be um but but yeah kind of 
actually giving students a piece of paper and, and giving students a pencil um, has been really revelatory and I think grounded them. Again, if we want to come back to that kind of embodied aspect of affect, um, just in the last semester has been really grounding, getting them to sit down. And this is a class on 19th century literature. It's 19th century children's literature, so it's arguably less alien than perhaps some of the, the concepts that Hannah's working with. Um, and that, you know, I have worked with in the past in early American literature, but getting, anyway, don't, giving students a freshly sharpened pencil gave them a confidence to, you know, to get on the dance floor, right? Um, so, so I think I'm not, I'm not advocating for a purely Luddite kind of approach, but actually just to, to remember that materiality um, and to, to kind of bring the classroom back to that from time to time has been one of the the strategies that I've used um, yeah, in relation to. I just had one other tiny thing I quickly wanted to add about that, which just occurred to me, which is this like resistance to hustle culture. And like our students are on social media because that's where they want to be social and have versions of avatars of themselves. That is part of their leisure time. And, and I feel like delineating the classroom space whatever that is and that might be that you actually want to say okay now we are going to turn to these things but not just having this sort of like totally blended thing because I think for us as like lecturers to say this is my leisure time this is my work time and for you as students you come into this space this is where we're doing the learning uh, you know there's I think it's it's not about being like yeah like you said it's not about being a Luddite or like thinking that it doesn't have value but that it absolutely has value but like needs to be considered um can I jump in as well before your question, Hilary? Is that right? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, what's interesting to me is that, so on my third year American Lit module, I, it's kind of presentation based. So they get a big proportion of their mark for presentation first. So those kind of lead the two hour session. <clears throat> and last semester was the first time someone used TikToks they'd made as part of their presentation. So those TikToks are on their own pages. Is it a page? I don't even know. I'm on, I'm on it, but I don't know if you call it a page. Um, but also I think this is part of this funny thing, right? Like we're dancing to a different play, but not just a different playlist. Like they don't even know who is on our playlist, let alone, do you know what I mean? Um, but I don't think we, I think we can like lean into that, right? Like, yes, we're in a different world to you, like 18 year olds. Like, of course we are. And that's good and fine. And maybe that's, that's something to celebrate, right? Like that we're, that we're not doing the same things. Um, but that they're bringing it in when they want to. Um, and that feels useful but also kind of I try to use like tech in my classrooms just for kind of but like to make it like this is quiz time now or this is like mentee needs a time to do some engagement activity to get like the blood pumping and the energy up and then okay now we've stopped that now phones go away and now we can do something else right like to utilize it but to, again like as Betsy's saying this like delineating space I think is really important right like this is phone time and this is like silly fun time but now this is where you get out the handout. Like honestly, handouts, like I am all for the handout now. I didn't think I'd be that person. But like here is a piece of paper and the student's like, oh, have you got more? But I print it on different colors, right? So I'm like the blue handout is the one with all the like bibliographic information on, like this is how you write an essay. And they're like the blue sheet. I'm like, yes, the blue sheet, like physicality, tactility. And I know color and color blindness and I know all those things, but like using, you know, flagging it up in different ways and making it accessible in different ways. So I think it's not, it's never either or, right? Like I think we lean in to, we're in a new world now and that's fine. So let's navigate it. <laughs> but thanks for your question, Robin. Brilliant. Uh, Hilary, you had a question for Hannah, did you say? I did, um, which is, I mean, basically just to ask, um, I don't know if you've been teaching American literature at, at Melbourne, but have you encountered different threshold concept I was sort of jumping off on the idea that the threshold concept actually is contextual as well you know and then it actually depends who you're talking to where you know what, what concepts need to be taught more deeply and which concepts can to a point just kind of be put out there as as, as shared kind of knowledge and shared information so I was just wondering if you've come across an experience where maybe the threshold concept was something that you needed to very quickly familiarize yourself with an Australian context or something that you found Australian students have um, grappled with? Um, um, yeah, uh, I've actually been teaching Australian literature in Melbourne and um, I was the 
convener, so I gave all the lectures. Uh, so I had a crash course in kind of Australian literary history. Um, and it was a very well-designed course before I took it over, which thankfully had a, about five weeks of pre-Federation material. So as a 19th centuryist, I was like, I can handle this. There's a lot of similarities uh, in terms of genre and tropes. Yeah, I've got this. Um, I was less confident in the 20th century. Um, but in terms of thresholds for the students, I actually went in thinking, students going to know about Australian history, right? Um, I had about a quarter of my students were exchange students. So I thought, going to have to put in a bit of explanation, explain some terms, some history. So yeah, I'd explain important laws and uh, historical moments. Um, but what kind of surprised me was how little the Australian students knew. And I thought understanding history was bad in the UK, understanding national history, but it's pretty bad in, in Australia. And I've met a lot of people kind of socially as well who aren't aware of a lot of these concepts or historical periods or extremely, what would appear to me to be an extremely well-known Australian writer, people wouldn't know. Um, it's like Patrick White. I'd meet people who didn't know he, who he was and he was the first Australian to win the Nobel Prize. Um, and I also found that it wasn't just historical concepts. Um, I taught um, a novel, um, a very contemporary Aboriginal Australian novel that came out 2019. And I talked about it in relationship to um, the Uluru Statement 2017 and the current referendum that's taking place this year. And just, I had so many students who just weren't engaged with this process that's happening right now. These are students who will be asked to vote in a referendum on the constitution of their country. I mean, I can't vote. Um, and just people just didn't seem to know what was going on. Um, so I'm still, I'm still struggling with that. I'm still trying to pitch material that's suitable for somebody who's come from the States or the UK or China, and then somebody who's been through, you know, 12 years of the Australian education system, and I expect to have a higher level. Great. I am getting conscious of the time, considering especially with Hillary being down under. Um, is there any final thoughts from our featuring speakers, the contributors for this fantastic new book um, that you would like to share? Or what, what would you like everyone to take off? How would you like, my final question maybe is, how would you like this book to be used? Is it to for educators, in cl for classes? for what? Where would you like to see this book go? We had a conversation like when we started the book, <clears throat> Hillary and I, that so much of the kind of pedagogical scholarship we were looking at, whether it was for HEA things or, you know, like that CPD. Although I do run some HEA sessions, by the way. So I want to just say mine is super fun, just to clarify. Um, and for my SFHEA application, I talked a lot about feeling and it was good to get it in there um, and to talk about the difficulty of teaching other people, especially other stuff, right, who put up way more boundaries than um, undergrads do. Um, you try and help someone rethink a lecture and they just shut down. Um, and I think that's what we kind of wanted that like so much of the pedagogic literature that we were engaging with is very either generic, right, or is kind of rooted in some kind of other kinds of disciplines. And we were like, what about literature? That Like not many, when they talk about the literature, they're not talking about books, are they, right? They're talking about like the pedagogic literature. And we're like, no, but we actually teach literature, literature with, with like texts and we have texts in a room. Like you all don't have texts, you have like labs or something so we were like we want to book that literary studies and related right cultural studies film studies american studies people could pick up and use and think about in their classroom and we really pushed our authors uh to to do kind of two things at once to be both theoretical and reflective to both theorize and frame what they were doing as well as talk about the feelings involved and, and to kind of be personal in ethics, which again, I think we're not encouraged to do, right, in academic writing. It's like, take yourself out of it, take the eye out of it. Well, no, put the eye in it. 
Um, I don't think we've got any essays that does not start with like I or some kind of like grounding statement. Um, so we would love it if other lecturers or tutors or teachers or even, you know, anyone within HE really that's thinking about text in some kind of way to pick it up and use. I think there's an essay for anyone really in here. Like there's a variety of approaches and methods and topics. What do you think, Kelly? Yeah, just to reiterate that that so much of it was, I mean, I think the the single sort of most insistent question that we asked for is just more of what that looks like in the classroom, right? And and if possible, how did you resolve? How did you work through? What are some of the practical strategies that you can offer other people to say when you encounter this, you know, A, these to, you know, to validate and recognise those feelings um, and to, to help people sit with them, but also to say, right, and here's, here's how you do turn that to productive, creative, pedagogical ends. Um, and that's, you know, that's, I mean, I'd say, we, you know, nobody has favourite children. We don't have favourite essays. We don't have favourite contributors. But I think what marks out the two essays that we've discussed today is they take very different approaches, but they both offer really clear pathways to how to work through difficult feelings for students and teachers right they they describe they theorize they reflect and then they say okay here's a thing you can do to um to move through this and, and navigate this and that I think yeah I I my feeling is that there's not enough of that in the pedagogical literature um and it's certainly yeah it's it, that's certainly kind of my my experience um so so we wanted we wanted practical strategies but beautifully written and you know and theorized and um you know vulnerably presented and that's that's what i think our contributors did in spades um and we're really yeah we're really happy with that aspect of the result so Absolutely, and I truly, <laughs> I truly enjoyed reading it, and I will definitely keep that when I'm planning my next teaching classes and things. Because there, like you said, there's so much practical things there. It's not just theories. It's not just that. It's it's practical as well, which I find incredibly beautiful, especially for someone like myself who's just starting in in higher education, and then hopefully get to plan a lot more of my own classes in future. So things like this will be you know, those kind of a handbooks to have at hand when you're planning up ahead. Um, as said, we're coming to an end now. So I do recommend everyone to go and get the effects of better, uh, of the effects in pedagogy in literary studies from Routledge um, and get it to your libraries, get it in your own bookshelves. It's just a fantastic tool. And thank you for our, all our speakers today. And I hope you get to enjoy your nights and your days, depending where you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.